I'm going to be doing some readings from Henry Cordman's Alone with the Alone, Creative Imagination, and the Sufism of Ibn al-Arabi. Preface by Harold Bloom. As men's prayers are a disease of the will, so are their creeds a disease of the intellect. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson tells us neither to pray nor to believe. If we would free the self, one part of the authentic self wanders light years out in the interstellar spaces in exile from us. The other part is buried, so deep within us that to resurrect it would be another return from exile. We find the God without less accessible than the God within, but that is elusive. Descending to the deepest self is so difficult that I have arrived there two or three times only in two-thirds of a century. In that fullness, we know and are known. In solitude, a peopled solitude, so knowing and being known, our diseases of the will and of the intellect cease to trouble us. Why pray to the stranger God? He is so alienated from our cosmological emptiness that he could never hear us. We might want to pray for him, but to whom? As for believing that he exists, we have no term for his wandering on the outer spaces, so existence does not apply. What matters most is necessarily either too far outside us or too far within us to be available, even if our readiness were all. What is the use of gnosis if it is so forbiddingly elitist? Since the alternatives are diseases of the will and of the intellect, why invoke the criterion of usefulness? Prayers are a more interesting literary form than creeds, but even the most impressive of prayers will not change us, let alone change God. And nearly all prayers are directed anyway to the archons, the angels who made and marred this world and whom we worship, William Blank warned, as Jesus and Jehovah, divine names misapplied to our prison warders. The accusers who are the gods of this world have won all the victories and they will go on triumphing over us. History is always on their side, for they are history. Everyone who would return to us to history always performs the work of the accusers. Most scholars worship history, the composite God who rewards their labors by granting them their illusion of value. Emerson remarked that there was no history, only biography, which is another Gnostic recognition. Do not pray, do not believe, only know and be known. Many among us know without knowing that we know. Bentley Layton catches this when he suggests that gnosis should be translated as acquaintance rather than as knowing. Acquaintance with your own deepest self will not come often or easily, but it is unmistakable when and if it comes. Neither the will nor the intellect spur such acquaintance, but both come into play once it is achieved. To be acquainted with what is best and oldest in yourself is to know yourself as you were before the world was made, before you emerged into time. At 67, I look back, and for a while I see nothing but time. Yet I can recall three timeless moments, the first when I was 11 or 12, and I'd only just reread all of Blake and Hart Crane. The streets of the East Bronx fell away, and I was in the imaginal world that Henry Corbon describes in his eloquent commentaries upon the Sufi masters of Shiite Iran of centuries ago. That world, by reading Corbon, I have learned to call Hercalia, but it takes various names in other traditions, and sometimes no name except poetry itself, in many visionary poets. By visionary, I do mean Gnostic in a precise sense. I do not mean overtly orthodox Christian poets, such as Hopkins, Eliot, Auden, among them, who found themselves upon the canonical New Testament and the Church Fathers. Corban's works are among the best guides to visionary tradition. Corban was the peer in his generation of Gershom Sholem and of Hans Jonas, but he differs from their overt stance of historical and philosophical scholarship and regard to Gnosis and Gnosticism. Sholam, like Moshe Adel after him, was both Kabbalist and scholar of Kabbalah. Yet Sholam rarely affirmed his Gnostic affinities to Moses Cordovero. Korban was a passionate partisan of Ibn Arabi of Andalusia, 
and of Shwardi and Sheikh Ahmed Asai of Iran. For Korban, Shiite Sufism was a gateway to all the Gnostic traditions. Prayer in these traditions has nothing in common with the disease of the will that Emerson rejects, just as creed or belief, a disease of the intellect, has nothing in common with the knowing of Korban in his traditions. This preface seeks to examine only one aspect of Korban's work. What does he mean by creative imagination in Ibn Arabi and by the imaginal realm in his spiritual body and celestial earth and other books? Henry Korban lived from 1903 to 1978, was an ironologist by profession, whose teaching and research in Paris and Tehran centered upon Islamic mysticism and philosophy, particularly in Shiite Sufism. I came late to the study of Korban, my interest in him aroused by conversations with Hans Jonas and Gershom Sholem, and I regret having had no opportunity to meet Korban before he died. Since 1979, I have reread many times all I could discover of Korban's writings and regard myself as being much under his influence, as my recent book, Omens of Millennium, 1996, reflects throughout. Expounding Suawardi, Korban locates the imaginal realm in the mystical earth of Hercalia. Quote, Between the world of pure spiritual lights, Lucis Victorialis, the world of the mothers in the terminology of Ishraq, and the sensory universe at the boundary of the ninth sphere, the sphere of spheres, there opens a mundus imaginalis, which is a concrete spiritual world of archetype figures, apparitional forms, angelus of species and of individuals. By philosophical dialectics, its necessity is deduced and its plane situated. Vision of it in actuality is vouchsafed to the visionary apperception of the act of imagination. The essential connection in Soavardi, which leads from philosophical speculation to a metaphysics of ecstasy, also establishes the connection between the angel angelology of this neo-Zoroastrian Platonism and the idea of the Mundus Imaginalis. This, Soavardi declares, is the world to which the ancient sages alluded when they affirmed that beyond the sensory world there exists another universe with a contour and dimensions and extension in a space, although these are not comparable with the shape and spatiality as we perceive them in the world of physical bodies. It is the eighth, Keshvar, the mystical earth of Arcalia, with emerald cities. It is situated on the summit of the, of the cosmic mountain, which the traditions handed down in Islam call the mountain of Quaf, from the man of light in Iranian Sufism, 1971, page 42 to 43, end quote. In Alone with the Alone, page 20, Korban remarks that Soravardi and Ibn Arabi share the same spiritual family. The imaginal realm of Arcalia appears in Ibn Arabi as the creative imagination of part two of Alone with the Alone. But the link, really the fusion between Soravardi's cognitive image and Ibn Arabi's, is marked out most clearly by Korban in Spiritual Body in Celestial Earth, pages 135 to 43. There, Korban translates from chapter 8 of Ibn Arabi's masterwork, the book of the spiritual conquest of Mecca. Quote, Know that when God had created Adam, who was the first human organism to be constituted, and when he had established him as the origin and archetype of all human bodies, there remained a surplus of the leaven of the clay. From this surplus, God created the palm tree, so that this plant, Nakalia, palm tree, being feminine, is Adam's sister. For us, therefore, it is like an aunt on our father's side. In theology, it is so described and is compared to the faithful believer. No other plant bears within it such extraordinary secrets as are hidden in this one. Now, after the creation of the palm tree, there remained hidden a portion of the clay from which the plant had been made. What was left was the equivalent of a sesame seed. And it was in this remainder that God laid out an immense earth. Since he arranged in it the throne and what it contains, the firmament, the heavens and the earths, the worlds underground, all the paradises and hells, this means that the whole of our universe is to be found there in that earth in its entirety. And yet the whole of it together is like a ring lost in one of our deserts in comparison with the immensity of that earth. And that same earth has hidden in it so many marvels and strange things that their number cannot be counted and our intelligence remains dazed by them. 
from Spiritual Body and Celestial Earth, page 136 to 37, end quote. It is one of the most extraordinary creation myths that I have ever encountered. God fashioning Adam out of the Adama, or moist red clay, had a remnant, and from it he made the palm tree, Adam's sister. And even from the palm tree's formation, there was a remainder, the size of a sesame seed. And this tiny fragment, God laid out an immense earth, called the celestial earth of Hercalia by Shorawardi. This alternate earth, Ibn Arabi affirms, is the world where theophanies and theophonic visions take place. Shorawardi tells us that Hercalia, the alternate earth, is an imaginative universe that stands between two worlds, our sensory earth and the intelligible universe of the angels. Another great Iranian Sufi, Sheikh Ahmed Asahi, I'm pronouncing that very badly, I'm sure, calls Hercalia the interworld, and a later sage says that it is the world through which spirits are embodied and bodies spiritualized. Of Hercalia, as Earth of, of Visions, Corban remarks that this is where Hermes dwells, Hermes being the tutelary spirit of all Gnosis, from the Hermetic corpus through Christian Gnosticism, the Sufis and the Jewish Kabbalah. Because Hermes is at home there, Hercalia is the Earth of Resurrection, I return to Alone with the Alone now, where Corban laments our degradation of the imagination into fantasy. See Duke Theseus in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and somberly notes that there has ceased to be an intermediate level between empirically verifiable reality and unreality, pure and simple. Page 181. Very suggestively, Corban blames for this debacle all the normative theological accounts of a Creatio ex nihilo, accounts against which all Gnostics forever rebel. Later in Alone with the Alone, Corban again distinguishes the field of the imagination from the creation out of nothingness and urges that we must think rather of a process of increasing illumination. Corban's great strength is that he writes from Hercalia, as it were, I will suggest a translation into some of our more mundane concerns. In doing so, I will still follow Corban with particular reference to the new prelude that Corban added to the second edition of Spiritual Body and Celestial Earth. There, Corban begins by noting that between the sense perceptions and the intuitions or categories of the intellect, there has remained a void. This space between of the active imagination has been left to the poets, but Corban wishes to reclaim it for the spiritual life as a cognitive power in its own right. I myself, without disagreeing with Corban, nevertheless, would say that for our culture at this time it may be more pragmatic for seekers to discern the reality of the active imagination in Shakespeare rather than Ibn Arabi or Shuardi, though under Corban's guidance Ibn Arabi and the other Sufi sages will help us to define the imaginal realm in Shakespeare. My motivation is double. Without de-esotericizing Corban, I hope to make him more available, and while Shakespeare needs no rescue, we badly need to be rescued from the cultural materialists who are alienating students from Shakespeare by reducing him to the supposed social, supposed social energies of what they call early modern England. I don't wish either to turn Shakespeare into a Sufi or Henry Corban into Shakespeare, but instead to link the two in a process of increasing illumination. The imagination was viewed as a as lesser faculty in Shakespeare's age. Though there were visionaries who did not agree with Sir Francis Bacon that the imagination was only a messenger sent out by the mind, a messenger with a tendency to usurp the authority that the reason attempted to assert, Shakespeare, being not of an age but for all time, invented or reinvented both the imagination and human personality, both pretty much as we have known them since. Incredibly more diverse in temperament, and cognition than Milton and the Romantics, Shakespeare provided the materia poetica that helped lead visionaries like William Blake, P.B. Shelley, and later Goethe to their conviction that empirical sense itself can be a metaphor for spiritual emptiness. Corban's imaginal realm is portrayed more fully and vividly by Shakespeare than by the Sufi sages, and not only in overtly visionary dramas like A Midsummer Night's Dream, Pericles, and The Tempest. The cosmos of the high tragedies, Hamlet, King Lear, Macbeth, intermixes the empirical world with a transcendent element, one that cannot be identified with normative Christian ideas of order or of the supernatural. One of Corban's Sufic names for the imaginal realm is the angelic world, 
which is perfectly applicable to Shakespeare's cosmos, provided that you conceive of the angelic order as being more hermetic than Christian. Hermetic angelology, studied by Corban in his Avicenna and the Visionary Recital, posits a middle reality between sensory perceptions and divine revelations. Elsewhere, Corban translates Sheikh Ahmed Asahi as declaring, The world of Hercalia is a material world, the world of matter in the, in the subtle state, which is other. Being material but other is a splendid metaphor for what we tend to call the alter ego, who in Sufism, as in allied traditions, is the guardian angel who strangely is our own self. Hercalia, like Shakespeare's creation, is not just a representation of material or historical reality. Shakespeare shows us aspects of experience that doubtless existed before him, but he illuminates what we could not see without him. That precisely is, is what Corban means by the imaginal world, the place of the soul or souls. Corban, it is true, is expounding theophany, and Shakespeare rarely does, not being an esoterist, but a poet-playwright. Hegel praised Shakespeare above all other dramatists since Euripides by saying that only the Shakespearean protagonists were free artists of themselves. The Sufis interpreting the Quran like the Kabbalists and Gnostics interpreting the Bible also were free artists of themselves. I myself am in danger of violating a warning made by Korban as he concluded the prelude to the second edition of Spiritual Body and Celestial Earth. Quote, in this connection, we wish to give a caution. We have come to see for ourselves with pleasure, though not unmixed with some anxiety, that the world imaginal, as used specifically in our researches, has been spreading and even gaining ground. We wish to make the following statement. If this term is used to apply to anything other than the mundus imaginalis and the imaginal forms as they are located in the schema of the worlds which necessitate them and legitimize them, there is a great danger that the term will be degraded and its meaning be lost. By the same token, we would remind the reader that the schema in which the imaginal world is by its essence the intermediate world, and the articulation between the intellectual and the sensible, in which the act of imagination as, um, as imaginatio, vera, is an organ of understanding, mediating between intellect and sense, and as legitimate as these latter in that world itself. If one transfers its uses outside this precisely defined schema, one sets out on a false trail and strays far from the intention which our Iranian philosophers have induced us to restore in our use of this word. It is superfluous to add, the reader will already have understood this, that the mundus imaginalis has nothing to do with what the fashion of our time calls the civilization of the image. End quote. As an admirer of Corban, I am touch uneasy with this, partly because he seems in this moment a fine caution to forget how eclectic in their spirituality his Sufis are, and he himself was. When Corban quotes from Balzac's hermetic novel, Louis Lambert, he is as much in contemplation of Hercalia as when he interprets I Ibn Arabi in Shakespeare is a much larger form of Balzac amidst much else. Corban's work has a particular emphasis that distinguishes it from the comparable researches of Jonas, Sholem, and Idel. It sweeps out, with marvelous universalism, to make incessant surveys of the what Corban calls the situation of esotericism. Sufism is an esoteric interpretation of Islam, even as Christian Gnosticism was of early Christianity, or Kabbalah of Judaism, or Jacob Bone and Blake were of Protestantism or Emerson was of post-Protestantism, of New England Unitarianism. One of the crucial paragraphs of Alone with the Alone centers upon Ibn Arabi's precise parallel to Emerson's self-reliance. Quote, This is the very relationship we outlined above in the idea of the angel, compounded with the idea that every theophany necessarily has the form of an angelophany. This should avoid any misunderstanding when we come to speak of the self and the knowledge of self. The self is a characteristic term by which a mystic spiritually underlines its dissociation from all the aims and implications of denominational dogmatisms, but it enables these dogmatisms to argue in return that this self, experienced as the pure act of existing, is only a natural phenomena and consequently has nothing in common with a supernatural encounter with the revealed God, attainable only within the reality of the church. 
The term self, as we shall employ it here, implies neither the, the one nor the other acceptance. It refers neither to the impersonal self, to the pure act of existing attainable through efforts comparable to the techniques of yoga, nor to the self of the psychologist. The word will be employed here solely in the sense given it by Ibn Arabi and numerous other Sufi theosophists when they repeated the famous sentence, He who knows himself knows his Lord. Knowing oneself to know one's God, knowing one's Lord to know oneself, this Lord is not the impersonal self, nor it is, is it the God of dogmatic definitions, self-subsisting with, without relation to me, without being experienced by me. He is the he who knows himself through myself, that is, in the knowledge that I have of him, because it is the knowledge he has of me. It is alone with the alone, in this syzygic unity that is possible to say thou. And such is the reciprocity in which flowers the creative prayer which Ibn Arabi teaches us to experience simultaneously as the prayer of God and the prayer of man. Alone with the alone, page 94-95. End quote. This eloquent exposition is a classical account of Gnosis, as relevant to Valentinus as it is to Emerson. Gnostic prayer is primarily Gnosis. You know even as you are known. Corban names this creative prayer and much of alone with the alone is devoted to describing it. Quote, for prayer is not a request for something. It is the expression of a mode of being, a means of existing and of causing to exist. That is, a means of causing the God who reveals himself to appear, of seeing him, not to be sure in his essence, but in the form which precisely he reveals by revealing himself, by and to that form. This view of prayer takes the ground from under the feet of those who, utterly ignorant of the nature of the theophonic imagination as creation, argue that a God who, who is the creation of our imagination can only be unreal, and that there can be no purpose in praying to such a God, for it is precisely because he is a creation of the imagination that we pray to him and that he exists. Prayer is the highest form, the supreme act of the creative imagination, by virtue of the sharing of roles, the divine compassion, as theophany and existentiation of the universe of beings, is the prayer of God aspiring to issue forth from his unknownness and to be known. Whereas the prayer of man accomplishes this theophany because in it and through it the form of God, Surat al-Haq, becomes visible to the heart, to the act of imagination which projects before it in its kibia, the image whose receptacle, epiphanic form, mazar, is the worshiper's being in the measure of its capacity. God prays for us, which means that he epiphanizes himself insofar as he is the God whom and for whom we pray. That is, the God who epiphanizes himself for us and by us. We do not pray to the divine essence in its hiddenness. Each faithful prays to his Lord. Rob, the Lord who is in the form of his faith. Page 248, end quote. I know of no description of Gnostic prayer, Sufic, Kabbalist, or Christian Gnostic, as lucid and moving as this. And again, I will risk the aesthetic analog by citing our relationships to certain characters of Shakespeare. The form of God here is as much a dramatic image as a spiritual one, and manifests itself when something in us identifies with Hamlet or Falstaff in, the similar, in similar sharing. Recently, lecturing upon Hamlet and Falstaff at Princeton, I was bemused to hear the leading cultural materialist of Shakespeare studies denounce me for manifesting the politics of identity. Politics are about as relevant to our sharing with Hamlet or Falstaff as they are to Corban's Sufic sharing with God. Sufic prayer, as Corban describes it, is what can be experienced at very rare moments when we read Shakespeare, and even rarer ones these bad days when we see him performed. This is not to suggest that Shakespeare was God, not an idea that would alarm me, but rather to say that the Sufic forms of God have, to me, not to Corban, the same imaginal status as Shakespeare's greatest characters. The imaginal realm is a concept generous enough to embrace both the spiritual and the ascetic. The aesthetic. Who, anyway, can define the borderline between gnosis and poetic knowledge? The two modes are not identical, and yet they interpenetrate one another. Are we to call the gnosis of Novalis and Blake and Shelley a knowledge that is not poetic? In domesticating the Sufis in our imagination, Corban renders Ibn Arabi and Shorawardi as the Blake and a Shelley whose precursor is not Milton but the Quran. 
The freedom to interpret the Quran cost Shorardi his life at the not very enlightened hands of Saladin. The situation of esotericism is always a hard one between the rock of literalism and the hard place of the dogmatic doctors of the law. The imaginal realm, to me a pragmatic entity, a common sphere where Shakespeare composes his poems and St. John of the Cross his prayers, is for Korban the place of Shiite Sufi creativity throughout tradition. Korban, like Sholem and Jonas, is remembered as a scholar of genius. He was uniquely equipped not only to recover Iranian Sufism for the West, but also to defend the principal Western traditions of esoteric spirituality. There are several lasting achievements fused together in Alone with the Alone. The major one is the restoration of the function of creative imagination in Shiite Sufi spirituality. Yet readers whose interests are literary and aesthetic and aesthetic, or who turn to non-Muslim Gnosticism will recognize their deepest concerns also. In a lecture given at Rome in 1956, now available in his cyclical time and his Meli Gnosis 1983, Korban traced the influence of the Gnosis of antiquity upon the Iranian Sufis. Quote, Gnosis was not born in Islam in the Middle Ages, any more than it is a simple Christian heresy of the first centuries of our era. Rather, it is something that existed long before Christianity. Unquote. Page 192. Gnosis and even Gnosticism emanated from elements already present in archaic Jewish religion, preceding the times of David and Solomon, according to the researches of Adele. The so-called Scythian Gnostics were Jews, and Gnosis was both a Judean, Sumerian, and an Alexandrian Jewish phenomena before the advent of Jesus. Persistent to this day among Jews, Christians, Muslims, and even secularists, Gnosis itself, in all its manifold forms and variants, also deserves to be called a Welt religion. From, from cyclical time in Ismaili Gnosis, page 193. Of that world religion, we have only a handful of great scholars who are also prophetic guides. Korban is one of them, together with Sholem, Jonas, and Adel. Of all these, Korban had the widest range and the largest sympathies and stands today as a wisdom writer of the highest eminence. That's the end of the preface. I want to read a few quotes related to Ibn Arabi that I um, I think are, are really good... Um, preface, uh, really good prefaces to getting into some of the deeper ideas of Alone with the Alone. I'm not going to read the entire text. I'm going to read different passages that have stuck out to me and that I've meditated on and been moved by. And um, I'd encourage you to also, perhaps, if you're interested in these topics, get a copy of Alone with the Alone, the book. Um, and uh, I think you will find it a very challenging and rewarding experience to delve into these into these areas and to really seek to understand the role of active imagination in our spirituality and how it's perhaps thousands and thousands of years old and predating all of our modern forms of religion. And, uh, you know, I think it's a fascinating endeavor and I, I, I equate this effort to the Greek um, admonition uh, that was written, one of the three things written on the temple of Apollo, to know thyself. Thank you. Between the universe that can be apprehended by pure intellectual perception, the universe of the cherubic intelligences, and the universe perceptible to the senses, there is an intermediate world, the world of idea images of archetypal figures, of subtle substances, of immaterial matter, this world is as real and objective, as consistent and subsistent as the intelligible and sensible worlds. It is an intermediate universe where the spiritual takes body and the body becomes spiritual, a world consisting of real matter and real extension, though by comparison to sensible, corruptible matter, these are subtle and immaterial. The organ of this universe is the act of imagination. It is the place of theophonic visions, the scene on which visionary events and symbolic histories appear and their true reality. Here we shall have a good deal to say of this universe, but the, world, but the word imaginary will never be used, because with its present ambiguity, this word, by prejudging the reality attained, 
or to be attained, betrays an inability to deal with this at once intermediate and intermediary world. By Henry Corban from Alone with the Alone. Ibn Arabi observes that the most perfect of mystic lovers are those who love God simultaneously for himself and for themselves, because this capacity reveals in them the unification of their twofold nature. He who has made himself capable of such love is able to do so because he combines mystic knowledge with vision. By Henry Corbon, Alone with the Alone. The individual is identified with the perishable. What can become eternal in the individual pertains exclusively to the separate and unique active intelligence. Henry Corbon, from the Alone with the Alone. Others love you for their own sakes. I love you for your own self, and you, you flee from me. Dearly beloved, you cannot treat me fairly, for if you approach me, it is because I have approached you. Henry Corbon from Alone with the Alone. Ibn Arabi was above all the disciple of Kadir, the green man. We shall attempt further on to indicate what it signifies and implies to be the disciple of Kadir. In any event, such a relationship with a hidden spiritual master lends the disciple an essentially trans-historical dimension and presupposes an ability to experience events which are enacted in a reality other than the physical reality of daily life, events which spontaneously transmute themselves into symbols. By Henry Corbon from Alone with the Alone.